the meteor for old money. On the 3rd of January, 2009, a meteor appeared in the sky of our society. Until that time, banks were the kings of this planet, like giant lumbering dinosaurs completely dominating for hundreds of millions of years, with complete disregard, even contempt, for the tiny furry mammals that they routinely stepped on as they walked around the planet. But something had changed, and very soon, those mammals will inherit the Earth. In this new environment, Bitcoin doesn't compete against the banks, because Bitcoin is adapted to a new and different environmental niche. Bitcoin is not the money of the physical space. It is the money of the internet. Bitcoin is not the money of the nation state. It is the money of the world. Bitcoin is not the money of the current generation. It is the money of the generations to come. It doesn't just compete against banking. For Bitcoin, banking and borders and physical money are irrelevant. Just like to mammals, dinosaurs were irrelevant. And to aerobic bacteria, anaerobic bacteria are irrelevant unless they're suitable as food. When you look at this new environmental niche, you have to realize it's not just one new species of money, Bitcoin, but an explosion of the ecology of money. On January 3rd, 2009, there were 194 currencies. Today, there are more than 3,000 currencies. Of those, all but 194 are digital, decentralized, internet monies. They're the new species that lives on the internet. Most of them will go extinct. Most of them will disappear. But the species as a whole will continue to evolve. When you look at the evolution of money in this environment, you have to realize that there are many factors which will affect this evolution. One of the factors is us, human beings. We give these things life. The evolution is not evolution by random mutation. It is directed evolution by designers. In this room, there are people who are directing the evolution of these new currencies. In doing so, they're responding to environmental stimuli, supply, demand, the needs of customers, the applications that they have in mind, untapped markets and opportunities into which traditional currencies can't fit. They direct the evolution of these currencies in order to take advantage of these new niches. But there's also a broader environment because at the same time, these new currencies are evolving, old currencies are in crisis. We are now facing an unprecedented currency crisis around the world that is affecting hundreds of currencies and hundreds of countries. It is affecting every central bank. We are in an environment that hasn't existed during the last 200 years. When I was growing up and studying some basic macroeconomics, economic orthodoxy said that the lowest you can go with interest rates is zero and that you could never go there, never go full zero. And now, 20 different central banks are at zero. Not just temporarily, some of them for eight years, some of them longer. I think the Japanese bank is the longest at zero. Some of them have also gone negative. Never go full negative until a couple of years ago. That was unthinkable. Oh, there's some good parts in the next one. Serving the majority. Bitcoin is not going to destroy the central banks. Bitcoin doesn't give a damn about the central banks. Central banks are doing a pretty good job destroying themselves. Oh, hello there. I didn't see you guys come in. Welcome to Bitcoin Talk Show. I was reading just a little bit there from Andreas Antonopoulos's The Internet of Money, Volume 2, bum, 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 available at Amazon.com and bookstores near you. Uh, check it out. Uh, but like Andreas was talking about, Bitcoin really is a meteor for the old money. And it's funny now to have all these smaller meteors uh, hanging around as well. Like he says, some of them will survive, some of them will die. Uh, I think he claims they're all decentralized and they're all internet monies, but I don't think all the internet monies are quite the same. Some of them are more Bitcoin than others. But let's get started today on Bitcoin Talk Show. Today is Saturday. September 1st, 2018. My name is Thomas Hunt, and here's what's happening. 
today in Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin is up 2.6% in the last 24 hours. Pow! With a last of 7,198, a high of 7,210, and a low of 6,969. That's $1 for 13,870 Satoshis, well on the other side of the 15,000 Satoshi barrier. Let's give this sucker a spin. Actually, today, here are the top 10 altcoins sorted by volume against the price of Bitcoin. Ethereum up 3%, Bitcoin Cash up 12%, EOS up 3%, Litecoin up 3%, Dash up 10%, Ripple up one and a quarter, Ethereum Classic down one and a quarter, Dogecoin rockets up 36% and joins the top 10 in volume for the first time since we've been monitoring altcoins. We've also got Zcash up 4.5%, joining the top 10, Qtum, Ontology, Tron, all left out of the top 10, but also showing 2%, 4%, and 3% gains, respectively. Everything's up. Let's check the top distributed applications. It is a weekend, so we should see some decline. IDEX still maintaining above 2,000 active users on what's now being called a token exchange, not just an exchange. Fork Delta in second place with about 1,000. CryptoKitties in third, but 400 users. Who cares, really? Bancor behind that with 300. Pow, 3D, 300 as well. Ethereum on, FOMO 3D, rounding out the 300 club. Still much less than 5,000 active, daily active users for the top 10 distributed applications. Looks more like uh, maybe just about 4,000, maybe in the 5,000 range. So certainly not more than that. Looking at the most active blockchain uh, chains, we have a change here on the active blockchains. I was about to say EOS, BitShares, and Steam, or EOS, Steam, and BitShares, but now we have EOS, Bitch. Bitch moves into second place as a very active blockchain. I've heard of some stress testing. Uh, they are at 61% capacity of the Bitch blockchain. Uh, following that is Steemit. BitShares, Ethereum, and Bitcoin pushed out of the top five by the raging bitch. Checking at the Ethereum transactions, they're still at 100% capacity with 64,000 unconfirmed transactions. So if you're waiting, just wait longer. Bitcoin is at 47% capacity. Operators are standing by. Our Tallycoin fundraiser seems to be stuck. I'm not sure this QR code is working. Give it a test for us. Our fundraiser has raised 0.0777 Bitcoin towards our goal of $1 million. You can donate now with your Bitcoin wallet. It even takes SegWit and all those things. Our address is 3G5. Donate now. Thanks to our last donor, 0.005, who donated on the 30th of August. We also had donor 0.0018626 and donor 0.002. Thanks so much for supporting the show. Uh, we'd also like to add for a limited time only, we are opening up the Mad Bitcoins Amazon wish list. Uh, that's right. They won't let me paste it in the chat. Uh, they've gotten there. They've thought of me, but there it is. Uh, still won't let me paste in the chat. How clever of a... Uh, how clever of Google to block the pasting of Amazon wish lists. I respect that. Uh, but here it is right here, the Amazon wish list. We are wishing for the Lego architecture in Las Vegas and the Kurt Vonnegut coffee mug. Uh, doesn't seem like Amazon is going to let us or uh, Google is going to let us put the uh, link in there. Uh, but check that out and uh, bang, check out the wish list. And uh, Jeremy says to refresh. I don't know if I can refresh anything, uh, but we'll let you know how it all works out. And if we do receive the Lego set, we'll do some kind of live build. Uh, so check that out. Uh, now we've got to see what was happening yesterday on the World Crypto Network. Uh, remember, you can subscribe to this video down below. We have 60,887 subscribers. We are just 113 subscribers away from our goal of 61,000 subscribers. I know we can do it. There's a hundred live right now. Be sure to click that bell if you want to get notified uh, or follow us on Twitter. 
Uh, we get about 30% of our traffic from Twitter. So hello, Twitter users. And uh, hello to everyone watching the podcast later on iTunes. Remember, you can always get the audio versions of these shows on iTunes on the World Crypto Network. Yesterday was a pretty big show, but it wasn't quite WCN Friday. It was almost WCN Friday. I think uh, Max is moving and we didn't hear from Shembu Spain this week, but hopefully he'll be back next week. Uh, we had Bitcoin talk show up Friday morning, a very popular morning. Felt like about five different crypto shows were all airing at the same time. It's uh, great that we spread these out over multiple channels and that no one can work together with anyone anymore. Uh, good job, team. Uh, but here at, at the World Crypto Network, we are working together. And we had our first show, Bitcoin Talk Show, yesterday morning. Uh, let's see how it went. Ooh, it got really big for me. Surprise. <laughs> I was reading the Bitcoin Standard, but it wasn't the Bitcoin Standard. It was full of poems. <laughs> it's a trick. Uh, yesterday, we got 85 likes. A uh, slow Friday morning, and we got 559 views. Uh, so a little quiet for a Friday morning. Uh, checking it out in yesterday's comments. Yesterday's comments. Metal Gear MK3 writes that tail sail technology isn't new, but it does work. It can also be used on airplanes. Cool. We could uh, get wind power from airplanes and ships. It looked kind of like a circular windmill. Uh, I don't know much about it. Like he says here, it's tail sail technology. So another group of words for me to look up, uh, something new to learn about. Uh, Roy is excited. He says, harness the wind, harness the sun, leave the carbon in the ground. And he says the special interests will protest. Let them cry. Let them throw tantrums. Uh, we've got a better plan with Bitcoin and renewable energy. Sounds pretty good. Let's see. Jim D says, and he includes a timestamp. Remember, if you'd like to comment on these videos on YouTube, you can include a timestamp just by writing 22 colon 09. YouTube automatically puts the timestamp in there. And Jim D writes, Thomas explains why blockchains and distributed ledger technology is hogwash. And I wish I didn't have to do this. I don't want to be the one to explain that blockchain and digital technology, uh, digital ledger technology doesn't do anything and that it's an inefficient database. Uh, I feel so many times like, uh, oh, what is it, you know, Chicken Little where the sky is falling and you tell everyone and they're like, no, nah, this guy's not falling. Blockchains are awesome. And you tell some more people and you tell some more people and it comes down to, uh, these consultants have sold these ideas to these government people and to these corporate people, and the consultants get paid if they believe, and the government and the corporate people get paid if they believe, and all the marketing people get paid if they believe, and everybody's out there doing all this false belief, and it's built up this huge blockchain bubble, and to me, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, I look at it and I say, okay, the blockchain's an inefficient database for pretty much everything except for currency, right? The specific example of Bitcoin, Bitcoin actually does deliver truth. Uh, when I say I have, you know, 0 0.0777 Bitcoin in my fundraiser, also it'll probably beep if you uh, donate. Uh, but when I say I have that in my fundraiser, that's what I have. The system has referred to truth. When you have a blockchain, say, of diamonds, and the people at the mine say the diamond is clean, and they put it in the blockchain, and it comes to me, all I have is their word. If the people at the mine were lying and the diamond was dirty and they said it was clean, all the blockchain's done is preserve the integrity of the lie. Uh, it could be a big lie, it could be a lot of lies. Uh, the core of this also seemed to me like the corporations were openly saying that they can't trust their databases or they can't trust the people who enter information into their databases. Uh, the only thing that a blockchain really even kind of protects you from if you're mining it internally, if you're the only one who mines it, uh, is workers or employees changing the data. Uh, so there is some, if you have a rogue IT department, you're kind of protecting against that, but not quite as well because you're mining it internally. So in that way, there could be uh, controls and things set on there. Uh, so it seems very strange that all these people are caught up in this delusion and that it's gone this far. Uh, I remember it last time people are all into the blockchain and, and you know, I caught it too. I, I want things to be on a blockchain. I'm not trying to like rain on your blockchain parade. 
I told people, I was like, hey, I should put my blog on a blockchain and then people will mine it and they'll get my blog entries, you know, we'll, we'll send it around. It'll be cool. Uh, and then they were like, yeah, but who would mine your blockchain? I was like, no one. Who would value your blog coin as something? Uh, no one again. Uh, who would, you know, have an exchange where I could trade my blog coin? Once again, no one. Uh, so it seemed like there was a lot of no one supporting my blockchain. And that's just as an individual, uh, as a corporation, even if you're mining your own blockchain, you're not getting any of the benefits of distributed networks and the way that Bitcoin allows an unconnected network of computers to host data and determine truth. Uh, the simple problem is, is that the problem that blockchain solves is not the problem that corporations have. Uh, the Byzantium generals problem, imagine if you have several generals spread out across the city and we all need to get orders and agree on the orders and they need to be uh, factual, accurate orders. Also, we can't trust any of these people. Uh, we can't trust the couriers. We can't trust the generals. Anyone with access to the system might edit it because they might have been turned, right? They might have a gun to their head. They're a perfectly good general, but they have a gun to their head. Uh, so we need this network where Bitcoin, we can broadcast the truth of these orders and we can use untrustworthy computers to deliver the truth. And that this network of untrustworthy computers brings us to this agreement, this consensus, uh, you know, and it's something simple like the consensus is we have one Bitcoin or the consensus is the attacks at dawn, right? It's not very complicated, but we need it to be unchangeable. We need it to be, edit, you know, send it around. That's what this solves. Uh, when you come to the corporation problem, you're in a controlled environment. You're the only one mining your blockchain. You're the only one using your blockchain. You're the only one putting data in your blockchain. It's all under one house. It doesn't get the same kind of protections and it's not even really open to the same kind of attacks. The kind of attacks that Bitcoin is present preventing against, the corporations don't really have. So when they adopt this bizarre Byzantium data structure to their you know, workaday problems, it doesn't make any sense. And it seems like, I mean, I, you know, it's crazy to say this is a phase and it's crazy to say that all these conferences are wrong and that all these people are wrong. And certainly they must be smarter, right? They must be the smarter ones on this blockchain thing. I must be wrong. I, I still continue to believe this. And I've talked to other, you know, type programmer people, Peter Todd or Eric Lombroso, people like that. I've asked them about blockchain and, and they say the same thing. And I'm surprised again that uh, we're in agreement and that I haven't gotten it wrong somewhere. But it just seems like someone's come along to all these corporate people and said, we'll give you 10 times the IT budget if you say you're working on a blockchain project. And when this blows over in three to five years, we're going to give you 10 times the budget again to get us a new kind of database. And I don't know, we'll call it a relational database or a distributed database. Uh, maybe it's just a distributed database technology because that seems like all they're really talking about. They're not talking about building a censorship resistant network, right? Your, your network problems are different. You're an internal guy. You're working for Blogger. You need to make a bunch of servers that work together to host a blogger, right? To serve up the data. Uh, you're a Bitcoin guy. You're trying to host a Bitcoin network. You don't need the same kind of server requirements. You don't need the kind of load and the kind of adaptability uh, that an open and under attack network like Bitcoin receive uh, versus a not under attack network like Blogger. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense for them to do this. So I, I keep waiting for them to wake up or me to wake up. Uh, but I'm not so sure. Uh, so let me know in the calls if you're a big blockchain supporter, if you just went to a DLT technology conference and you can school me on this, I would love to hear why blockchains make sense for anything other than Bitcoin. We also had the Bitcoin group yesterday. Uh, we did pretty good. Bitcoin group's a pretty popular show, a very active chat. We got this strange hashtag for eBang, uh, I guess, because we talked about the new mining company. Although with uh, YouTube, you think the eBang would mean something else. You know, it has kind of a double entendre sound to it. Uh, we've got 142 likes. So that's the answer. Uh, maybe 143 would be better, though. Uh, we got 1,252 views. Pretty good for Friday. And we're going to check out everyone's favorite part of the show. Yesterday's comments. Uh, Jeremy Sager was back and he uh, timestamped the show. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Jeremy does this for a lot of the World Crypto Network shows and uh, he's just a volunteer. He's just helping out. So be sure to give Jeremy a thumbs up 
and uh, send him some good comments, say he's doing a good job. And remember, you can timestamp anything you want to in the show. If you agree with it, if you don't, if you disagree with it, you can put a little timestamp in YouTube and you can help create uh, the archive of the World Crypto Network. Uh, B. Alduayan likes the show. He says, I continue absorbing the information. I like people from different disciplines, history and linguistics in this case, converging in Bitcoin. Different perspectives are simply enriching. Thank you very much. And it was a great chat with Gabe yesterday, Gabriel. And uh, he's big into music. He has a big background, like he says, in linguistics and advertising and a lot of different fields. And it was great to chat with him about Bitcoin yesterday. Uh, Max said, thanks, guys. Very interesting show as always. Now, uh, when moon? <laughs> when moon? And uh, Kim Hughes, Hughes says, kudos. Great show, mate. Uh, thanks so much, Kim. And at 18... Uh, minutes in the show he asked why haven't we seen a blockchain token to fund a white paper that glows in the dark like fiat until it is held up to the light i can see a qr code for bitcoin uh so interesting idea i think he wants to use maybe disappearing ink or maybe uh fluorescent ink or whatever it is to hold a qr code sounds pretty cool uh, you could also paint that on a sneaker or on a t-shirt that might be kind of fun too uh, so a lot of good art ideas I don't know that you need a blockchain token to do it, though. <laughs> you might be able to uh, raise a couple hundred bucks on Tallycoin and uh, print some T-shirts to get started. That's a good idea. On uh, Tallycoin, you can borrow money from people uh, by just asking them to donate and saying, hey, uh, I, you know, I'm a good guy. I need 200 bucks to buy some T-shirts. I'm going to print Bitcoin stuff on them. I'm going to sell them and I'm going to get more than 200 bucks. And this is going to start my business. And if you did that on Tallycoin, I'll bet people would give you 200 bucks. Uh, people are pretty reasonable, especially if you tell them what the money's for. Uh, Roy Westberger says, we need a blockchain coin, not a coin with a blockchain. Oh, uh, wait, strike that. Maybe we need to reverse it. Uh, Hoddle B says, both these guys are top notch. And Blackbird Garden writes, quality Bitcoin group, Thomas and Gabriel. And uh, Roy Han's a fan of Digibyte, I guess. So uh, here's to spam. Uh, but thanks so much to everybody who commented. And if you want to be a part of yesterday's comments tomorrow, you just have to comment. Uh, yesterday's comments. That's what it's about. Uh, yesterday on Bitcoin Talk Show, we went over and uh, checked out the new Wikipedia entry. Uh, we were glad to learn that Royce to 59 is considered to be a hero of Bitcoin after mentioning the cryptocurrency and not alike, the song from the new Eminem album, Kamikaze. And as he said uh, yesterday, uh, everyone used to be biting nickels. Now everyone's into Bitcoin. Uh, so times have changed. As uh, Ian Martino writes, I remember everything was about to collapse. The community was fighting. Blocks were full. The price was down. The CIA was assassinating our best people. Paycoin was taking over. Then not a light came out. And the next thing I knew, we all had Lambos. Great story from Ian DiMartino. Uh, Coindesk had legitimate breaking, breaking news and actually used the tagline correctly. Uh, it was breaking news yesterday that the Ethereum uh, developers met in a meeting, not unlike the Federal Reserve or the creature from Jekyll Island, and they decided instead of delivering three Ethereum a block, they would deliver two Ethereum a block. Uh, just like Moses coming down from the mountains with his stone tablets and his interest in the company that made stone tablets and his pre-mine full of stone tablets. And Moses said, there will be less stone tablets. It was a beautiful moment. Apple orders the Coinbase wallet to remove crypto collectibles. It looks like Apple is tightening the rules on altcoins that represent items in game. Uh, there's some kind of dune buggy game. You can get items for it. They could have an altcoin. And apparently it was part of the new Coinbase wallet. So crypto collectible collectibles on the run. Uh, also, another good chance for them to get some free publicity, of course. Remember, you want to be controversial. Crypto kitties, it was kind of a good thing that they crashed Ethereum, right? Uh, everyone who knew about Ethereum. Uh, knew about crypto kitties the minute they crashed the whole network. 
Uh, yesterday, we had the Bitcoin group. I found this cool koala. Looks like a 70s revenge film in just uh, five or six story frames there. Bunanump, bunanump, bunanana. Do, 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 do. <laughs> it's a great one. Uh, a Pompliano is back on Twitter and he writes, We had a big, <laughs> this guy loves lists. He's big into lists. A uh, big week in crypto. Lloyds of London insuring crypto. Nice. Who buy bought a public company? I didn't hear about some of these. Line launched a cryptocurrency. Okay. Morgan Creek launched index. Sounds good. Eminem track. Shouts out to Bitcoin. Now you're speaking my language. Now I'm excited. Yahoo Finance adds crypto. What's a Yahoo? China cracks down on crypto. Is it 2013 again? I got to check my watch. SEC may change accreditation laws. Hmm, I'll hold my breath on that one. Uh, meanwhile, they're having trouble on Twitter because Craig Wright, the alleged Satoshi Nakamoto, has unfollowed Roger Veer. Uh, people are speculating. They say Roger then also unfollowed Craig Wright, but it may be that Craig Wright has simply blocked Roger Veer and that the, the once two great friends combined with their pal Jihan, the three musketeers of Bcash, are falling apart. Craig Wright's going his own way with Bcash, Satoshi's vision, which is going to have a 128 meg empty block, whereas Bcash, not Satoshi's vision, is only going to have a 32 meg empty block. Uh, so the battle of the empty blocks continues as we have no choice but to reference Swift again with first the Yahoos, and now we have those, uh, what were they, the Brombignagians and the Brambignagians or something, but one of them cracked their egg on the side, which you know is the right way to crack their egg, and the other one cracked their egg uh, from the top, which as you know is wrong. And for this reason, they had hundreds of years of war and killed and hated the other. And of course, Swift was talking about religion, uh, but that's practically what we're talking about here as well with Satoshi's vision uh, being romantically linked again uh, Craig Wright, if he really was Satoshi, if this was Satoshi's vision, uh, Roger and Jihan would have to go with him, right? Uh, from a biblical perspective, if this is really the return of Jesus Christ and he's back, uh, Roger and Jihan have just turned their back on the one true Satoshi. Sorry, Jesus. I mean, Satoshi. Anyway, uh, it's all happening out there. Meanwhile, Peter Todd is out somewhere in Canada living in a tent, uh, looking at mountains and snow. Uh, very Canadian of Peter Todd. Way to go, Peter. Uh, he says he's spending his nights implementing new op codes for Peter from Bitcoin Cash. Uh, never without a joke, that Peter Todd. Uh, I'm kind of enjoying the new Tom Clancy, Jack Ryan TV show. Uh, certainly Amazon advertised it to me absolutely everywhere. And seeing Jim from The Office uh, suddenly incredibly fit uh, out there challenging the world, impressing people. Uh, slightly nerdy guys can be smart and violent too. Uh, I don't know. It's an interesting show. Of course, I read all the Tom Clancy books back in the 90s and uh, big fan of his. Uh, glad to see he's still producing work after his death. That's an impressive, twi an impressive trick. Uh, not much in common with the old Jack Ryan books of the Cold War, as of course, Jack Ryan is now fighting the War of Terror, War on Terror. And uh, no, it's interesting still, though. I mean, they introduced this character that we know is going to be Jack Ryan's love interest. And they introduced a character that represents the James Earl, uh, uh, say James Earl Jones. And this guy is John Allen Greer so, or something like that. So they have confusing names. But, you know, James Earl Jones, the big character, the heavy in uh, a couple of the movies. Actually, I think he served with several Jack Ryans. It was pretty interesting. Uh, as the actor kept changing. Uh, they even said Chris Pine played Jack Ryan, but I haven't seen that one. Uh, the Ben Affleck one was the last one I saw. Uh, but interesting stuff, interesting series. Also interesting to see, much like the movie School of Rock, uh, that these normal characters from the 90s have now become archetypes, uh, the way they're trying to make the Star Wars characters into archetypes, where you can tell stories about them forever. And that they're just a part of our culture. And, oh, there's always been a new Jack Ryan. Like, there's always been a new James Bond uh, or a new Batman. Uh, these characters are starting to get passed down. 
and it's getting really complicated uh, when five people have played uh, Jack Ryan and five people have played Batman and uh, there's overlap. <laughs> you know, we're going to get a Jack Ryan that has played Batman or a James Bond uh, that has played Batman. Can anyone play all three together? A Bond, a Batman and a Jack Ryan? Uh, you'd have to be heck of a British accent, I guess. Uh, and now we're here. We're here where we are. We're on Bitcoin Talk Show Live. Uh, let's check out the mainstream media. They mainly care about the price. Bitcoin versus altcoins, which is the most usable for merchants? Neither. Neither. I don't even have to look at the article to answer this question. Neither are useful for merchants because there aren't enough consumers on the other side. If there's no consumers and there's no merchants, it's a chicken and an egg game. What it's going to take is everyone stores their value in Bitcoin. Bitcoin becomes very popular. Everyone looks at it. They can store their value in it and then they can spend it. It's the mania. The merchants start coming in the mania. It's the same time that the people start buying. Uh, the mania starts on both sides. I don't know how you start it on both sides, but that's what we need. Bitcoin's next big software update to feature new language for crypto keys. All right, what have you got? Uh, the ways that keys are stored is being changed to a new language. Uh, let's see. <laughs> They're not telling me what it is. Oh, well, they've been uh, removing the account system out of the Bitcoin Core software. It used to have different accounts. Uh, you could save them and savings. Uh, so that was confusing. So they moved that. Uh, they made it easier to move the wallets around. Peter Willie's new language aims to tag each key in Bitcoin, both the public and the private, with a label that can unlock it, changing the way we think about wallets. Hmm. So that's a very interesting new development. We're going to have to learn some more about that. Uh, just reading about it right here. They say they're also making changes for mobile versions of Bitcoin Core, including partially signed Bitcoin transactions. Uh, that sounds pretty good. A transaction that are not fully signed, but can be passed around until finally broadcast. Uh, this might be a way to get your Bitcoin transactions through if you're off the grid somewhere. Maybe you could give them to someone else who could give them to someone else who could eventually hit the network and broadcast your transaction. Uh, kind of like the Lightning Network, the way that you know, you're know you passing that hot dog around. Uh, they just need you know, a reason to deliver your hot dog. So they get a little bite of the hot dog. But there's a lot of hot dog. Uh, they're also working on connections with Trezors and Ledgers and hardware wallets. Uh, so the Bitcoin Core client and the Bitcoin Core software continue to be updated and improved. Way to go, Core team. Like to allow notifications? No. <laughs> Bitcoin's great start of September is over 7K. Where are the bulls heading? Well, I'm sure you can tell me on the chart. Uh, Bitcoin bulls are making a strong case. Still not over the high point of $7,700. So keep an eye on that one. Uh, experts point to a bullish scenario. Hmm. Sounds like they're uh, quoting those $20,000 end of the year predictions again. Good to see it. For now, the market sentiments and the charts are all indicating towards a bullish scenario. So it's a wait and watch game for now. Bitcoin remains range bound at $7,000. Analysts bearish. Interesting stuff from Ethereum World News. <laughs> and they say Bitcoin has a chance to reach $3,000. All right. I'll believe it when I see it. Bitcoin at $7,000. Undervalued or overvalued by Panos Moridokoulos who is always the one who says, Bitcoin's dying, Bitcoin's alive, Bitcoin's dying, it's alive. And now the price, the price, the price. Bitcoin prices continue to enjoy bullish trend from Forbes, different author this time. Uh, Bitcoin prices trending higher, possible market rebound. However, if Bitcoin prices decline below 6,450, it could be a sign that the bullish trend is in jeopardy. This chart could explain why the Bitcoin bubble hasn't fully burst. It's a tulip's fault. And there it is, the introduction of Bitcoin futures. Wow, 
<laughs> That's painful. <laughs> we thought it would go up and it went down. As always, you can support the World Crypto Network on patreon.com slash WCN, where 33 patrons are donating $235 a month to support this show. You can sign up with your credit card for as little as $2 a month. That's cheap. You could also sub subscribe to support Mad Bitcoins, where our Patreon account continues to move the other direction, with 77 patrons presenting us with $469 a month. We were close to the $500 barrier, but we seem to be getting further away. Or you can donate Bitcoin or crazy altcoins to the QR codes on your screen right now. Or at tallycoin, T-A-L-L-Y-C-O dot I-N slash uh, one million. You can find our fundraiser at tallycoin slash one million, where 19 people have donated 0.777. Bitcoin, more than $559 towards our goal of $1 million. We're up to 0.06% of our goal. And now it's time to open up the phone calls here on Bitcoin Talk Show. It is Saturday morning, so a lot of people might be in sleep or watching Saturday morning cartoons. If you're not watching Saturday morning cartoons, you can give us a call right now at Skype World Crypto Network all one word, or at 518-600-1949. Seems to be some kind of biblical argument going on in the chat room. I'm going to just let that one go. Not going to touch that with a 10-meter cattle prod, right? Uh, not my business. But let's get it started on Bitcoin Talk Show. I'm sure you guys all want to talk about the new Jack Ryan show. Uh, you want to tell me about how it's propaganda or something like that. I'm sure it is. Uh, but if I know that it's propaganda and I watch it anyway, uh, then, whoa, does it still work? Maybe it doesn't. Uh, but it's always good to see a new fun Tom Clancy show. Uh, we've also checked out uh, recently, let's see, oh, good old uh, Westworld. I finished Westworld. I finished uh, Handmaid Tale, the book. I've almost finished uh, Un-F Yourself, the book. Uh, great title. <laughs> and... Uh, Almost as good a title as Rat Eft, which is the book about gerrymandering. It's so hard. It's the most important topic of all of our times, gerrymandering. And the guy writes the book and he calls it Rat Fucked. And I'm like, oh, man, I have to tell everyone to read this book about gerrymandering. Hello, caller. You're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Oh, he hung up after all that. I delivered my lines perfectly. Uh, they just didn't show. <laughs> it's always good when you've got Pontius Pilate going on in the chat. Uh, let's stack up some more biblical quotes, and uh, I'll talk about Westworld. Uh, I thought Westworld was good. I don't want to talk about specifics or spoilers. I'll try to avoid that. Uh, but generally, I just thought they kind of closed a lot of things down. There was a point in the series where, uh, maybe episode seven or eight, where there were infinite possibilities and I started to imagine and to dream and, you know, what are they going to do with all these people and what are they doing with this copy of the genetics and uh, maybe they'll make exact copies of all the people and then send them out and try to replace them and take over the world like body snatchers. And I was like, oh, that's a great one. And oh, maybe they'll have uh, they'll use it for ransom or they'll hold it for hostage or they'll, you know, sell it or they'll make something right. And then a lot of the a lot of the plot points that I really wanted addressed and expanded are kind of thrown away uh, by the end of the show without without spoiling uh, too much. I think that they just had a lot of sci-fi potential and they rolled it quite back to a lot of closet drama. Uh, even the solution at the end, going forward into the future, it's the the things open. They can write whatever kind of show they want now, uh, but they still have kind of three main protagonists. Uh, they're not that interesting. A lot of the answers about the show and the or the uh, the park and the society have been answered. Uh, now I think we're really going to go out into the society, uh, which again is full of possibilities. But I don't even want to think about them because I'm afraid they're going to just use the the most simple and the most uh, easiest uh, first off the tree type possibility and uh, just keep limiting the options. There was just so much so much they could have done, and I'm not sure that they're doing it. Uh, people in the chat asked if I've seen the Westworld movies. 
I have seen the first one from the 70s. I haven't seen the second one, which I think is more about uh, kind of the samurai world or the Japanese West world, uh, which is a cool idea that they kind of kind of addressed, but mostly threw away uh, in the new series. They kind of went there and they kind of didn't. They also kind of went to an Indian world like um, uh, India, uh, dots, not feathers. That's probably a horrible thing to say, but it's from Goodwill Hunting. Uh, that probably doesn't explain it make it better <laughs> but uh yeah no I, I thought it was an interesting show dark dark at times uh creepy at times i don't think there'll be much anthony hopkins in the third season but maybe maybe they can write him back in somehow uh, it's like obi-wan kenobi he can just keep coming back as a ghost and keep coming back in different forms and so on and so forth all right they're still going hard uh at the bible in the chat <laughs> so I don't know where we want to go with that. I think the his, historically the the historic growth of Islam was an amazing spread of a religion. Uh, the way it spread originally starting out in Saudi Arabia, spreading across the top of North Africa, even going into Spain uh, because half of Spain was ruled by the Moors. And the Moors were Islamic, of course. And just the way it spread country to country, uh, sure, they did a lot of forced conversions, uh, but what a spread, what an incredible message, right? Uh, you look at these things uh, different ways. I prefer kind of to look at a religion kind of like Snow Crash uh, in a mimetic way to talk about the ideas and the language and the text and how good of a thought virus, if you will, is it? And a lot of these you can look at back in the day, they have a lot of uh, restrictions on food and a lot of restrictions on uh, what you do. A lot of these were just trying to keep people safe. Uh, pigs were unclean because they weren't cleaned properly and you could get sick from the meat. So it was a common sense thing that they put in the book. Uh, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Obviously, that's going to lead to a fight. More you know, common sense. Uh, so I do like these common sense aspects. And I think it's a way that our society learns. Uh, so I think it's very valuable, but I don't want to get into the whatever whatever fight they've got going in the chat. <laughs> I'm not touching that one. Uh, but you can give us a call at 518-600-1949 or at Skype World Crypto Network, all one word. Uh, anywhere in the world, you can ring us on Skype. It's around 10 o'clock. Uh, we got started a little bit late, so maybe we'll try to go to 10 to 15 so that we could uh, you know, make sure to get at least an hour in. Uh, if there are some calls, we could try to stretch it out all the way to 11 o'clock, but we're going to need some calls. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to talk more about Westworld or, uh, I don't know, I've been reading this David Mamet book called Chicago. You're probably not interested in that. Uh, I, I wasn't that interested either uh, for a while. I, I do like David Mamet. Uh, he's a playwright. He wrote the movie Untouchables. Hello, caller. You're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hello, Thomas. How are you today? Doing good. Uh, you got to turn your speaker down, though. Turn turn my speaker down? All right, cool. It stopped. It stopped echoing. Uh, caller, what's on your mind today about Bitcoin? Well, this is Frank Dashwood. <laughs> hey, Frank. How's it going? Uh, and, and, and as far as my thoughts on Bitcoin, I think that if you're in altcoins right now, you're making a shit ton of money. Ah, <laughs> there it is. The magic of altcoins, huh? Oops. Hell yeah, man. Screw that maximalism bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make some money. Yeah, I've seen uh, it. Uh, you know, which, I, one, which one did well for you, Frank? Which one was the winner? Oh, currently XVG. Um, I think privacy is a winner. And, it, you know, they've been picking up some adoption with regards to retailers. So, and, you know... Something caught my uh, my ear while while you were talking, and when you were downplaying the uh, the retail end of of cryptocurrencies, I, I've got to really really disagree with you there, dude. Bitcoin peer to peer cash, it's in the title. It's meant to be spent. Sure, that it's fine that it's in the title, and it's fine that the you know great experimenter or the the watchmaker who set up the universe uh, had that goal. Uh, but in reality, I, I've been there, right? I've run a shop where we took Bitcoin. I've helped run a website where we took Bitcoin. No one spends it. So if no one spends it 
and there are no merchants, then you have problems on both sides. I think those problems are completely insurmountable. I've seen people go door to door in San Francisco, give people a tablet, put them on a map, tell people that they're there, and then no one shops there for years. Uh, so I think it's been tried. I think the way when it's going to work, it's going to work when there's a mania for Bitcoin and when the mania drives up both sides, when the merchants want it and when the consumers want to spend it. And right now, the merchants don't want it and the consumers don't want to spend it. So I don't think it's going anywhere, no matter what somebody wrote in the white paper. Well, you're, you're talking about things that are temporary. You know, back back in like 2012 through 2014, I was spending Bitcoin relatively regularly. Uh, and then it became a little bit difficult to do so because of this whole one block, one megabyte block size limit and how that kind of snarled up the network. Um, but as far as is using Bitcoin as as money or cryptocurrencies as money, there's a value proposition involved. And it is still too much work to to mine a Bitcoin to just piss it away on, you know, some whatever, you know, a, a burger or something like that. It's not quite there yet. But I believe that in the not so distant future, we're actually going to cross the peak on the U.S. dollar where Bitcoin is going to be worth so many U.S. dollars that you're going to be able to spend it. It's going to be affordable to spend your Bitcoin. It's not affordable to spend it right now. Yeah, I think we're still pretty far away from that. Uh, people could do it right now where they spend a little money and then they buy it back. Uh, but no one seems able locality, to do that. Dude. It's uh -huh. a matter of locality. You have the perspective that you do because you live in the United States. If you lived in Venezuela or if you lived in Turkey or any of the places that are going through a major monetary crisis right now, your perspective would not be one of, I can't spend it. It would be, who will take this as money? so I can put food in my mouth. Yeah, but I'm not sure if there's enough numbers or long-term support there to drive up the price of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not gonna be useful if it's only used in crisis areas, right? Oh, I, I agree, you know, but if, if I don't have access to it, it's useless to me as well. You know, and if I don't have access to the, the US dollar that's supposedly everywhere, then Bitcoin works as money for me. There you go. And that's uh, good enough, right, Frank? <laughs> good enough. Thank you, sir. You have a good one. Thanks so much for the call. Give us a call anytime. It's good to hear from you, Frank. And uh, you can call us now on Skype at World Crypto Network, all one word, or at 518-600-1949. Uh, what do you guys think? Is Bitcoin good enough money now? Uh, do we need the Lightning Network before Bitcoin really becomes a spendable currency again? Uh, was it spendable in the past or was that just kind of a, a special time where not that many people were into Bitcoin? Uh, so it didn't cost that much to move it around. Uh, maybe if Bitcoin is more popular, it's going to cost more to move it around. Let's see what's going on in the chat. We're going all the way back. Let's see what's happening. All right, so we we're talking about Bitcoin, uh, the dinosaurs, and the possibility of another meteor. Hello, caller, you're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. <laughs> I'm Mustafa. Hey, Mustafa, where are you at today? What's on your mind about Bitcoin? Oh, just, uh, you know, keeping it in the topic here, what you're talking about, uh, whether Bitcoin is uh, would work as a medium of exchange right now, if you could use it to, you know, pay people. And, and the, an the answer is yes, but on a smaller scale, you can't really, you know, everybody can't use Bitcoin right now. Seven billion people in the world. Um, it's, the you know, the net without Lightning Network, I don't think it's possible, but with the community uh like in the size that it is right now i think is possible for us to transact in bitcoin amongst ourselves do you, do you think we could use dogecoin instead would that solve the problem could we use dogecoin i mean dogecoin is up 60 percent today just a little fyi 
I have no idea why. I don't own any Dogecoin, and I wish I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's often I the mean, idea yeah, that people put out there. Is like super fast, right? So yeah, like, of course, because no one uses it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we could switch to any of the other blockchains like Dash or whatever, but no one uses them. So that's why they're really cheap. Once you start using them, the price would go up just like Bitcoin. And if everyone in the world started using Bitcoin right now, the price of sending Bitcoin would go way up. Uh, that's why we need a solution like the Lightning Network, where we can send around smaller parts of Bitcoin and pay even smaller fees. Right, and the and the speed as well is is a big thing with transactions because you don't want to go buy something and have to sit there and wait, just staring at the person that sold you the the item, you know, uh, waiting for the however many confirmations make you feel comfortable, you know. That is a, another uh, obstacle to merchant adoption is you kind of do have to wait ten minutes to get a block, sometimes fifteen minutes because remember the ten minutes thing is only an average. Uh, we get it all in our head that it's like a clock and, oh, there's another block in 10 minutes, but really there'll be a block in five minutes or 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's going to be one of those or maybe in the middle. Right. So uh, you'd have to wait a long time to get your meal uh, if you had to wait for a block and uh, they'd have to make Bitcoiners pay up front or some kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't sound like a good deal. No, no, not at all. I am super excited about uh, the Lightning Network, though. I was watching some videos, some people talking about all the innovation that's happening. And like there was a lot of people claiming that by the end of the year, you're going to uh, have some uh, like uh, point of sale software that's going to be ready for merchants and, uh, you know, they'll be able to use it right away. So hopefully, hopefully that's true. Now, now, I hate to be a, a downer here and I hate to be a broken record, but even with faster, cheaper payments, I don't think merchant adoption is going to work. I think that this is great that we're building it out as a system and it's the kind of system we need. And there'll be a lot of Bitcoiners using this system and a lot of people will start sending money around and paying for lunches and all the things we used to do with Bitcoin back in the day. Uh, but I still see the same problem of a lack of merchants and a lack of consumers. And I see people saying, oh yeah, we're gonna have merchant point of sale. And you know, you could give them to them. You could pay the merchants to take Bitcoin for a year. Uh, you could pay them, you know, it has to be upkeep. You have to have a, a trained employee. You have to keep the tablet plugged in, uh, whatever kind of speculations you wanna put on them. If no one at all shops there for an entire year, they're not gonna accept Bitcoin anymore. Uh, they might not even take the trouble to take down the Bitcoin accepted here stickers. Uh, because after an entire year, who cares, right? I, I really think it's the yeah, same situation even I mean, with if Lightning. you think about it, it you, if you let's compare it to, uh, you know, when credit cards were getting popular and they probably had the exact same problem, you know, when all the credit card companies went around to all the, the convenience stores, um, you know, selling the processing machines. I actually used to do that for, for a short while. It's like a commission-based job, you know, and um, and if nobody has credit cards, then nobody's going to use the processing machines then the you know the store won't really be incentivized to to take it right or to you know to that's why people were giving them to for free the companies but with bitcoin there is no company so it'll just take time and i think that uh all the software needs to be ready and and you know and working first before people decide whether or not they need it you know because they will eventually need it and people that get set up early or people that get set up earlier will probably benefit the most you know so i don't think we really need to push too much for um for like mainstream adoption or merchant adoption or whatever but i think that you know the, the merchants will come along whenever they whenever they feel like this is a better option than you know uh using paypal or or, or cash you know because i've here in chicago a lot of smaller stores are are always with cash only signs outside you know uh smaller like pizza places or or you know whatever kind of little locally owned type stores you see them all the time saying cash only and they'll put an atm machine inside you know just to make it easier for you because they know everybody's got plastic and the reason they do that because it's because they cost it cost them so much money, right? How much money? It's like anywhere from like one point five to three percent you have to pay on these you know credit card transactions that you're accepting. But once they find out there's another way, another digital way, instead of using cash and having to hold the cash and everything like that, 
um, where they can do it with just as with almost no fees or very little fees like what the Lightning Network is going to provide. I'm pretty sure that people will start switching. Well, I, I think uh, Bitcoin facilitates a new kind of commerce and that we need new software and a new way of looking at this. Uh, I'm not sur so sure that the old merchants and consumer category really fits to Bitcoin. I think we need more things uh, kind of like maybe Open Bazaar or like Facebook Marketplace uh, where you can go ahead and scan it, take a picture of it, sell it for Bitcoin, uh, where there actually are buyers, that kind of thing. Uh, or we need the software where you can run a check stand or a register from your phone. And the new idea being that no one's going to have a point of sale machines. No one's going to have these old receipt papers. Uh, this isn't going to be there. But if we want to do business, we just have to be more flexible about the idea of what a business is. And so I think that uh, what we need is we need normal people to have the power of the business, which is not just paying me money once, uh, but paying me money on a subscription or paying me money when a job is done. Uh, like, you know, you drive truck, maybe if you drive a thousand miles, boom, you get paid. The computer can tell you drove a thousand miles. It's a contract or a smart contract based upon that. This is what I think Bitcoin and, you know, Ethereum or whatever, all these other altcoins, that's the kind of commerce I think we need to be doing is that new kind of more individual commerce, less corporate commerce. Uh, but flexible and able to scale right. for both. I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about individuals. All these places, um, they're not they're not big companies, or else they would have uh, credit card processing and all that kind of stuff already, you know, integrated. They'll probably have if they even have their own like uh, credit card that has the name of the store on it and everything, you know. But I, the people I'm talking about is just you know small businesses or uh, independent contractors. You know, I was, I was watching this um, TED talk yesterday about AI. And they were showing how in China, um, you know, their like AI adoption is like it's like through the roof. And they were showing even, um, you know, little like fruit stands and stuff like that, you know, that only accepted digital forms of payment. And the little lady just had a little like toothpick holding up a QR code and you would go and take your fruit and vegetables and just scan it with WeChat or whatever they were using and just pay her that way, you know, and that's completely fine. And, and the guy that was explaining it, it was this scientist or something and he was saying how like it's it's become more convenient in, in china people don't use cash people don't even use credit cards they it's completely mobile now it's, that's the most uh the most used form of payment is mobile pay and um you know i feel like the that you know lightning network is is gonna be uh the key to to for people to be able to use bitcoin in the same way and I, I do think that's what's going to happen is that all these people are going to jump right over credit cards and they're going to jump right over all of these legacy systems and chip and pin and all of these ideas and just start holding money on their phones and paying other people who have registers that are on their phones. Uh, I really think all of commerce now is going to be this phone to phone commerce. And uh, Bitcoin's great because you can do phone to phone, phone to phone commerce over the internet, right? You can scan the QR code from anywhere. You could send the address in email or text message. Uh, it's really great uh, for this. So yeah, I think we're we're in a prime position and we're just waiting for it to take off. Uh, we just need uh, merchants and consumers and new ideas and all these things to happen. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and even even think about like, uh, for example, let's say I'm, I, I produce some type of product you know, and I don't sell it myself. I actually hire salespeople and each person that I sell to, they go door to door selling people. And each person, I give them a little sticker, a little patch with their own personal QR code that, um, that funds straight to their account, you know, and, and, and gives them their commission or whatever. And each person has, instead of an ID badge, they just have their own QR code and they can just walk around, sell my product. And, and, uh, it's all done automatically it's all autonomous i don't have to make sure they don't steal the cash or pocket some money and say they they lost an item didn't sell it or whatever it is you know it's just right there so it, it's 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 going to be a lot easier i think it's going to be a brave new exciting world uh, we'll have to see how it goes uh, thanks so much mustafa for your call thanks for calling in thanks for having me yeah for sure see, see you guys later all right and uh, you can give us a call now on Skype at World Crypto Network, all one word, or at 518-600-1949. I'll try to keep the show going as long as we have calls. Uh, it's an interesting idea. We're talking a lot about Bitcoin and merchants. 
uh, how people use money in other countries. Uh, it's interesting. I've been watching, you know, Jack Ryan. I'm sure it's jingoistic American propaganda on Amazon. Uh, but still, it shows me a little bit of what life is like in other countries. And it does seem like they're ready for it. Like the, if they had cell phones, they're ready to go with all this kind of business that we're talking about. If you have a cell phone, you can trade uh, crazy altcoins. If you have a cell phone, you can buy all these utility tokens that then do things. Uh, you can even have Bitcoin actual money on your cell phone. And I do think people are right. It used to be the United States. It used to be America that would lead the pack on these kind of things. But now in Japan or in China, like you're saying, they're paying with WeChat. It's the most popular uh, form of payment over there. It's really taking off. And uh, they might be looping America once again. Maybe we're falling behind on our ability to pay digitally. Uh, maybe this takes off all over the world and then comes back here. And we're the last ones to get rid of our cash. Uh, the last ones to not carry our wallets. Uh, but it does seem like a very millennial thing, the idea that you could use your phone for everything. Uh, I'll bet they have cars where maybe your phone could be the key to the car and it opens the car and it starts the car and it inputs your destination. It really seems more and more like the phones are the cybernetic implants that we've been waiting for, uh, but we're just carrying them around in our hands and we're pretending that we're not uh, cyborgs. Uh, but think about it. When you have your phone, you're enhanced. You can look up the answer to any question. You can donate money. Uh, you can get in trouble on Twitter. You can lose your job and set the whole world on fire uh, with your phone. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, you can go on Facebook. You can screw up all your relationships. Uh, you can make more relationships. Uh, you can do anything with your phone. It's pretty amazing uh, compared to what they used to be. Uh, texting with the, the button keys, having to push it three times if you want a different letter. Uh, that's where we started. And we got so far. Uh, as people are saying in the chat, you buy Bitcoin, you buy altcoins. Uh, they're all up today. Uh, the price of Bitcoin is around $7,181 right now. Uh, looking at the top 10 altcoins, they're all still up about the same amounts we talked about earlier. Looks like Litecoin might be on the move. Dash up 8%. Uh, Dogecoin up 35% though. There you go. 92 Satoshis, almost 100. The prophecy, the prophecy of Dogecoin. <laughs> the coin that even its creator doesn't like. <laughs> but uh, let's see what's going on here. You can always support the World Crypto Network by donating to the QR code on your screen right now or at TallyCoin, uh, which seems still broken. Still no new transactions. Uh, TallyCoin has no idea that it's September. Uh, so tell TallyCoin that it's September, send us five bucks. Also, someone has set us at this perfect 777. If you mess it up, I wonder if they'll set us back to 888. Uh, some people are very meticulous about their numbers, right? They have a thing that they like. They like it a certain way. Uh, but we're going to try to keep the show open a little bit longer. Uh, if there's a phone call out there, people are all talking in the chat. Uh, why don't I stream on D Live? Because no one watches it. <laughs> 152 people are watching me, and I have no idea where they came from. Uh, we have no advertising. We have no support. Uh, we only have the support of you, the viewers. Uh, that's it. We're completely viewer supported. So, uh, no, we don't stream on brand new platforms that don't have discoverability. Uh, I like those ideas, and it's clever and it's cool and everything. And maybe I'll do one on D Live. And uh, I don't know, they did they did good when I did my introductory post on uh, good old Steam It, uh, but I think that was like a year or a year and a half ago. Uh, people simulcast. I could I could cause more problems with the stream, and I could screw up the sound and audio so that less than ten people would watch. Uh, so, oh, worst excuse ever. Full time full time geek spends all his time making YouTube videos uh, that no one watched. Oh, you try that. You try that. Hello, caller. You're live on the World Crypto Network. What's your name and where are you calling from? Thomas, Brian Jones here. How you doing, man? Doing good. Welcome to the show, Brian. How's it going? Oh, good, good. I'm actually just tuning in, and I know it's been a been a little while since I last called, so I just figured I'd kind of call and chit-chat a little bit. It is 
it is always nice when the when the markets are up and you know favorite coins are rallying. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. What's on your mind about what's been going on with Bitcoin lately? You know, really, I mean, not a whole lot has changed. I mean, I remember the last time we called in, we were kind of talking about the, I believe we were talking about at least the, uh, you know, like the back and the, the whole New York Stock Exchange thing. And if you look at, uh, like, what is his name, like Pompeo or something like that, like that guy on Twitter, he always posts like super bullish, bullish things about, you know, like the, the updates uh, weekly in crypto. and. There just always seems to be so much positive news and, and you know good news in crypto and and uh, one of these days it'll affect the price in a positive way you know. I definitely think so. We've definitely had a lot of positive news, uh, but still the price that keep uh, keep keeping it down and everyone wants it to mm -hmm. burst back out and there's always a it's funny there's different times in Bitcoin right there's the time when we're below the all time high there's a time where we're above the all time high. And there's a time when we're on our way back to the all-time high. And I think everyone wants to feel in that on our way back feeling. And, and nobody knows if we're there yet. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. It's true. And I mean, yeah, to be quite frank, uh, I don't mind that the price is what it is right now. Because, uh, you know, I I have my beliefs about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and, and just, uh, you know, kind of as a whole. Uh, I mean, obviously not everyone is going to be successful, but there's a few that that I that I really think, you know, will will definitely return to their all time highs and, and higher. But um, but anyways, yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is, I'm I'm excited that the price is this low because it just it just lets me, and it it kind of seems cliche, but yeah, it just lets me accumulate more coins, uh, you know, at these at these low prices because, in my opinion. You know, I'm not sure when when the mass adoption is going to happen, or even if it is going to happen. But I truly think it will. Uh, it's just a matter of when. And so, uh, when when the you know the big institutional money and in, in my opinion in the in the mass adoption happens, I think it's going to be you know the price of Bitcoin and Litecoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, will be like too expensive for me to purchase. Um, so, so right now, it at least gives me a chance these prices. Well, it's it's only percentage-wise. You could still get some of those currencies, even if they were more expensive. The, the great thing about Bitcoin and even the altcoins is that unlike a stock where you can only really get one Apple stock unless you go to Robinhood, uh, you can get percentages of Bitcoins or percentages of altcoins. Mm -hmm. so there's always hope. Yeah. There's hope. Uh, well, thanks so much for your call, Brian, and uh, give us a call anytime. It's great talking to you. Awesome. Thanks, Thomas. Bye. All right. And uh, you can give us a call now on Skype, World Crypto Network, all one word, or at 518-600-1949. And uh, thanks again to everybody for calling. I think we're getting uh, better and better at calling. I think a lot of us, uh, some people listen to talk radio, some people don't. But I think in general, uh, the audience is starting to get the hang of it, right? Uh, people are really good with like having a couple questions, having a couple comments, uh, keeping the line open so we can have more callers. Uh, it's great stuff. It's also if you have a question or a comment, it's always good to call in. Uh, that way we can answer your question. Remember, a lot of other people have that question but are afraid to call in. Uh, people are talking in the chat. Uh, we have that that saying in our culture called you get more flies with honey, right? Uh, you get more flies with honey. Uh, then vinegar, I think. And uh, there was a guy in the chat and he came in like gangbusters. Uh, most of us have been chilling here, having a nice video, enjoying a few calls, so on and so forth. Uh, but he was like, you've got to do what I say. I have come with the truth. What you're doing is wrong. And I am here to save you. And I don't think he saved anybody. He came in yelling and he came in all like sure of himself and very confident that what we were doing was wrong. And he told us how wrong we were, and now he's gone. And I just don't think that you're going to promote anything that way. Uh, maybe if you're paid by the altcoins and you just have to say the word of your currency 500 times uh, to get paid like Carl's Jr. Every time you say that, you get paid. You know, it's pretty smart. Um, maybe it's like that, or maybe you just don't know. But 
Uh, yeah, when you come into someone's chat and you tell them everything they're doing is wrong and that they should stop and immediately use your service that is brand new, that no one uses, that involves a bizarre token structure, uh, you're just not going to get very many people. It's, it's just not a good sales technique. So you can look in the funnel and we'll see how it goes. Um, but I, I don't think there's going to be anyone there in the funnel when you look. So... Uh, but if there are no more calls, we're coming up on 1030. Uh, so if you want to give us a call at 518-600-1949. Otherwise, uh, you can call us at Skype, World Crypto Network, all one word. Uh, otherwise, we're running out of time for the show. <laughs> this might be it. Uh, we did about an hour and a half here on Saturday morning. Uh, interesting thing about Saturday mornings, I watched a, another great YouTube video about Saturday morning cartoons. It was called... Uh, the history of Saturday morning cartoons. And like I've said before, you can learn anything on YouTube, uh, whether it's how to play blackjack or how to play poker or how to fix your pool or how to change the oil on your car uh, or how to buy Bitcoin. You can learn anything on YouTube. It's amazing. Uh, so I was learning all about Saturday morning cartoons and what a great time it was. Advertisers trying to sell us toys and trinkets, the latest shows. And then uh, how it dissipated and fell apart. Uh, it started out, you could only get cartoons on Saturday mornings. That was it. Then you could get cartoons kind of in this four and four hour, like four o'clock, five o'clock type block, three o'clock to five o'clock. They kept making it more. Then soon they had the Cartoon Network, 24 hours of cartoons. You could get cartoons whenever you wanted. Nickelodeon and Disney Channel, specifically kids programming. And this destroyed the beautiful world of Saturday morning cartoons and they don't even have them anymore. They don't even premiere new ones. There was a time where every year we would wait for the new Saturday morning cartoons and we would worry about which ones of our favorites would be canceled. And so many others would just completely disappear without us knowing. But uh, it was quite a magical time, Saturday morning cartoons. So if you remember that, you're old like me. Uh, you can tell me in the chat. I'll check it out later uh, to see if you guys had a favorite cartoon. Uh, but yeah, I remember often it was... Uh, go play soccer or watch cartoons. And I wanted to watch cartoons. Uh, sometimes you could tape them and watch them later. It was pretty good, but it wasn't quite the same because there used to be three channels, three different cartoons. You could flip around. Great choice. A wonderful time to be a child. I don't know what it's like now. I see the kids with the iPads. They seem to have access to everything and they're interested in nothing. Uh, so I don't know that it served them better. Uh, than my world where you had to work very hard if you wanted to have access to uh, all of the world's video. Uh, you had to work. Uh, when I wanted to watch the AFI top 100 films, I had to go video store to video store looking for them. Uh, some of them long out of print. Uh, I went to some very unique video stores, which is, of course, uh, where I would hang out. And I eventually did see all of the AFI's top 100 films on videotape back in the day. I was talking to people at a party yesterday and uh, trying to, they were saying, oh, well, how do I know if I'm a millennial? And I said, well, do you know what a card catalog is? And he looked at me confused and I said, yeah, I'm sorry, my friend, you're a millennial. You may have never known. It was like a Decker uncovering that he is an android or maybe not in Blade Runner, uh, that kind of internal question. I'm an android? Yes. If you grew up with the internet all the time, you're a millennial. <laughs> you're an android. So. Uh, the Dewey Decimal System. Yep, uh, we had. I I was in a unique time where it's a mixture, right? I remember the old system. I remember the new system. I used them at the same time. Uh, a lot of other people here might have been more old system only. The internet came along later, and then of course some of you are going to be the internet came along first. I have no idea what you're talking about about the old system, uh, but I'll go flip over the cassette tape and I'll rewind the VCR for you. And we'll have another episode of Bitcoin Talk Show tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be a great Saturday, uh, whether it's Saturday evening or Saturday morning. I hope you guys have a great show. <laughs> have a great time. <laughs> Crypto Daddy says he pisses people off at the store when he takes out his checkbook. Uh, I'll bet he does, but they should try to get your autograph. Uh, you're the last one with a checkbook. You're the last one. Sir, tell us stories. Tell us stories of the old days. And uh, maybe we'll do that next time on Bitcoin Talk Show. Uh, but thanks to everybody for joining us. I'm probably going to go watch some more Jack Ryan. It's pretty fun stuff. It's like a really long movie. Uh, I want to see if he uh, 
gets together with that Kathy, uh, Kathy Ryan. <laughs> so until next time, bye bye.